Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are in Asia Pacific, and welcome to Cushman and Wakefield's webinar on Asia Pacific Capital Flows. My name is Anna Town. I'm Head of Business Development Services for Cushman and Wakefield in Australia, and it's my great pleasure to be the MC of this webinar this afternoon. So we're talking today about our fifth annual Outbound China Investment Survey, which we'll present the findings to you shortly. And, you know, it's interesting to note that outbound capital from China has been one of the dominant forces in recent years. And we're going to talk you through what investment intentions are for 2020 from this capital source. In recent years, we've seen outbound capital from major mainland China really shift um, from overseas acquisitions to disposals. And last year in 2019, total investment volume from Greater China was down 79% since its peak in 2017, where there was over $42 billion of capital deployed into international real estate markets. And our speakers will go into this in more detail in a second. I'd like to point out that this survey was completed with Chinese investors in early March, which was in the midst of COVID-19 crisis. So this survey is really timely and um, to some degree should account for the COVID-19 impact on Chinese investor sentiment. So our agenda today is we have two speakers for you, James Shepard, who's head of research for Greater China. He's based in Shanghai, and he also leads Cushman and Wakefield's Asia Pacific Capital Markets Research Platform. And James will walk us through the results of the outbound investment survey. Catherine Chen, who's the Director of Research in Greater China, is going to explore a little bit further outside the boundaries of Greater China and look at the increasingly important role that Asia Pacific plays in the global real estate investment markets. Now, we do have an esteemed panel of capital markets experts for Q&A, um, which we'll do at the completion of the webinar. We have Dennis Yao, who's our Head of Investor Services, Asia Pacific, and his role is really about connecting and supporting our largest institutional investors across the Asia Pacific region and globally. We also have Dr. Hideaki Suzuki joining us. Uh, Hideaki is the head of research and consultancy in Japan, and he advises REITs, sovereign wealth funds, MNCs on their Japanese real estate strategies. So we're going to have some time for questions at the end of the presentation. I'd like to invite you all to click on the two little speech boxes that you could see at the top right of your screen with a question mark in there and submit your questions and our capital markets experts um, will answer those for you at the end of the presentation. But without further ado, I am going to hand over to Jamie Shepard to walk us through the results of the survey. Thanks, Anna. Next slide. Given time constraints on this call, I'll focus on mainland Chinese real estate investment overseas, but the report itself also discusses Hong Kong real estate investment overseas. So I encourage you to download the full version of the report. Please email me if you've not received a report link. So on the screen in the red acquisition volume bars on the left on this chart, we can see that a total of 8.8 .8 billion US dollars of mainland Chinese investment was deployed overseas in 2019, dropping 44% from the previous year and the lowest transaction volume since 2012. It's clear that the impact of a series of control policies on outbound real estate investment introduced from the second half of 2017 the tightened lending environment seen in 2018 and 2019, and the prevailing global economic uncertainty have brought renewed challenges to many Chinese investors. Looking at the blue disposals bar below the red bars, we note that not only were investment levels significantly lower, but for the first time since our survey began, we saw disposals outweigh acquisitions in 2019 with over 20 billion US dollars of overseas properties being sold by mainland Chinese investors. However, it's not all bad news, especially for us here in Asia. On the right, when asking about allocations by region, in the year ahead, we found that Asia Pacific witnessed a very different response than Europe and North America. No respondents plan to decrease their allocations to Asia Pacific, and a whopping 74% planned higher levels of exposure to this market, a factor which encouraged us to run this webinar. Next page. 
Encouragingly, on the left, when asked how intensified policy control since 2017 had impacted their ability to invest overseas, we found that the number of investors experienced a severe impact where it had become impossible to invest in overseas real estate had dropped from 24% to 16% over the previous year. Whereas those experiencing limited impact or no change had risen from 36 to 42% of respondents. However, Despite this shift towards a slightly more positive response, on the right, when asked whether in future outbound real estate investment policy restrictions might ease, just 13% agreed, 45% disagreeing. Next page. Another Im factor impacting activity through 2019 was tightened domestic lending environment. This has been affecting not just mainland Chinese investors' ability to make new acquisitions, but more importantly, the ability of some investors to refinance and hold their existing assets. And this has been a major factor which has contributed to the recent flurry of disposal activity of assets, not just internationally, but also back home in the mainland. On the top left, we asked, how did tight lending policy impact your global investment in 2019? According to the responses, this may now be having a less severe impact than we previously assessed, with only 29% of respondents citing this as having a significant impact at the current time. However, looking to the future, on the right-hand side, you can see that we asked, asked investors about the debt outlook with the statement, the domestic lending environment will improve in future. We found that only 13% anticipated the debt situation to improve. When combining the results of two survey questions on policy and debt, those mainland Chinese respondents who were experiencing a significant or severe challenge from a policy perspective and those who were experiencing a significant impact in respect of debt, or both, represented 65% of respondents. The challenges faced with regards to policy and debt were echoed when mainland Chinese investors were asked about the change in fund allocation to overseas real estate investment in 2020 compared with 2019. 2020 responses are represented by the red bars on this, uh, th this chart at the foot of the page. For the third year in a row, the number of investors that were increasing their overseas investment allocations declined, now down to just 13% of respondents. Those indicating plans to reduce their investment in the year ahead significantly outweighed those looking to increase investment, with nearly half indicating a pullback from international markets. A rebound of mainland Chinese investor acquisition activity in international markets is clearly not on the immediate horizon. Next page. Despite this apparent pullback in general, when looking at investment on a destination by destination basis, we observed some stark differences, with certain locations appearing to be attracting more mainland Chinese attention than in previous years. In the pie chart on the left, we note mainland Chinese investment transactions were weighted to development sites and the office sector in 2019. However, on the bar chart on the right, since 2017, our sentiment survey has identified a slow decline in weighting of appetite for the office sector. Perhaps unsurprising, given the government's stance towards acquisition of overseas trophy assets. Likewise, with the government's tendency to encourage value-added sectors such as R&D, investors' interest in this sector has grown to 13% and is captured under the other in this bar chart. In the middle of this chart, the most stark change in sentiment since the previous survey was the spike in mainland Chinese investor appetite for industrial and logistics, jumping from 12 to 39%. Again, not hugely surprising with the government's softer stance towards what may be considered as a value added and somewhat strategic sector given the Belt and Road Initiative. Next page. From a destination perspective, in the pie chart on the top, left, you can see how Hong Kong attracted the lion's share of mainland Chinese investment in 2019. However, on the right, in the pale blue, you can see how the majority of the year's activity occurred in the first six months of 2019. Australia took second place, overtaking the USA with a 13% share and 19 deals. Benefiting from potential for business relocations as well as trade and investment diversion caused by recent trade and other frictions, Investment into Asia markets such as Japan and Singapore appeared more, more appealing as investors may increasingly seek to weight portfolios towards security and stability. However, 
In the case of Japan, it should be noted that this was reflected in just one deal as the Western Tokyo was transacted in eight, at 890 million US dollars, therefore representing 100% of the mainland Chinese investment activity in the mainland in the Japan market. Despite investment volumes being down sharply in 2019, we've seen a greater array of destinations amongst the investors, and such markets can be seen in the chart on the lower left. Next page. Looking at the bar chart on the left, in our survey, when responding on the willingness to invest in foreign countries in 2020, a combined 50% of the investors were already invested in and planned to consider to continue holding assets or now considered the UK as a new target market. These are re represented by the light and dark blue bars, which you can see on the screen. Surprisingly, despite this coming in second place in terms of 2019 transaction volume, Australia appeared unattractive in the survey. This may be explained by the fact that although Australia has been in investors' radars for many years, mainland Chinese investors have generally struggled to deploy capital in this highly competitive market, which may have subdued their interest. In 2019, Japan, Singapore and Southeast Asian nations accounted for 19% of mainland Chinese investment. This growing interest was echoed in our survey with a strong showing of investors newly targeting these markets. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Catherine Chen to tell us more about the attraction of Asia Pacific and cross-border capital flows in this dynamic region. Thank you, Jamie. Now let's take a look at Asia Pacific's role in the world investment community. There are a lot of infographics on this slide and I'll briefly go through them. The top row shows improvement in the ease of doing business in APAC over the last 10 years, especially in places like China and India, who are and will con continue to drive job growth in the next decade. On the second row, figure 15 demonstrates the investor universe now comprises large proportions of investors based in Asia. And fi figure 16 shows there will be further increase as marked by the highest score of 6.87 of of cross-border investment within Asia Pacific, which refers to investors base, based in APAC buying out assets in other APAC regions. Um, lastly, uh, as shown by figure 17, the large majority of global investors now expect to increase their real estate allocation uh, to APAC regions in 2020. On slide nine, let's take a look at which APAC markets received the most attention as shown on figure 18, we found the largest 10 markets in, a in APAC represented almost 99% of the total investment in 2019. The most popular investment destinations included Japan and Singapore, which is also echoed by the increasing interest of outbound investment from mainland Chinese buyers, as mentioned by Jamie earlier. On figure 19, investment volume in Singapore jumped 58% year on year in 2019. While investment volume in Tokyo and Osaka also improved, Tokyo was the number one most invested market in 2019, which has surpassed Hong Kong, who was the number one in 2018. Beijing also saw a huge jump in the investment volume and will likely have a separate session on greater China markets um, in, the near in the near future to share more details. Moving on to slide 10, the most notable contrast between these two pie charts is how dominant office investment is in Asia Pacific, which accounted for nearly half of the total investment in 2019. Retail has also accounted for a significant share of 23%. In contrast, there is limited market for multifamily in APAC with the exception of Japan. Now, under the impact of COVID-19, our recent mainland China investor intention survey showed that there will still be uh, there will be increasing interest in data centers and logistics investment. And by contrast, investment volume in office, retail, and hotel will likely drop this year. Nevertheless, we think for well-managed office, retail, and hotel assets, or those hotels and retail properties that can be converted into office will still be in demand. Slide 11 just re-emphasizes the growing cross-border investment activity being witnessed in APAC and the proportion of capital uh, deployed uh, by investors within APAC is now on the rise and we expect this trend will continue in the near future. 
the final slide, key sources and targets of cross-border investment in Asia-Pacific in 2019. Japan was one of the most favored markets by U.S. investors, such as Blackstone's acquisition of Maple Tree Industrial Portfolio in Japan. An interesting case as a U.S. investor was buying from a Singaporean vendor for assets in Japan. And also the sales purchase of Logic Core Osaka Bay, which we also have the deal analysis on this case if um, anyone wants to know more detail. Just to likely touch on mainland China as the most popular investment destination in 2019, but this was not driven by the U.S. investors uh, who only represented 8% of the total transaction volume in mainland China. In comparison with a 38% share by Hong Kong investors and a 35% share by Singaporean um, investors. So lastly, to wrap up, how will COVID-19 impact capital flows within Asia Pacific? As we can see on this chart, U.S. was the largest source of cross-border capital in 2019. However, given the recent escalation of COVID-19 cases in the States, along with a few turbulences in the U.S. stock market, we would expect less capital to be deployed from the U.S. buyers um, um, in this year. In turn, there will likely be an increasing share of capital from the Asia-Pacific regions, in particular Singapore, Hong Kong, and Australia, based on the recent conversations we had with active investors in APAC. In terms of investment destinations, we would expect mainland China to remain in the top three spots for the share of investment volume in 2020, as based on a recent survey we, uh, we just conducted, show that investor interest in the Chinese tier one city still remains very high. In addition, there will also likely be renewed interest in mature markets like Japan, Singapore, and Australia, as safety and stability are now the most important investment determinants. Um, and with that, I will pass the floor to Anna to start our Q&A session. Over to you, Anna. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Jamie, for taking us through those charts and graphs and lots of statistics. Um, Catherine, you brought up COVID-19 impact, and that is a theme that is absolutely coming through the questions. So keep your questions coming. I'm going to ask them of our panelists now. I might start with Dennis, um, if I may. Um, there's a question around Singapore, and I think uh, according to the Cushman and Wakefield data, we've seen um, a real spike in interest um, from all sorts of capital from all around the world into the Singapore market last year in particular. I think it was up about 60%. Can you give us your view on you know, what the attraction is of the Singapore market? Um, which sectors are seeing most of this interest come into them and, and where those opportunities are um, for everybody on the, on the call today um, over the next couple of years? So I might ask that of you, Dennis. Sure, Anna. Hello, everybody. Um, the Singapore commercial real estate market staged a very strong rebound in 2017, following the rental recovery in the office sector. Favorable demand drivers, such as a positive economic environment and the strong appeal of Singapore as a preferred business location, as well as the expected decrease in supply of new office space post-2016, likely provided a window of opportunity for investors to get into the market. The series of major sales of trophy assets, such as Asia Square Tower 1 and 2, combined four billion US dollars in value. Dual Tower and Galeria combined 1.1 billion have led to the growing interest in the office properties by institutional players, opportunistic private equity investors, high net worth wealthy individuals and family offices. Apart from office, hospitality assets were also in great demand in 2019 due to favorable fundamentals as tourism arrivals continue to increase and hotel occupancy rates remain high. Unfortunately, COVID-19 struck and the appetite for the sector waned. However, in the Singapore context, we have yet to see any distressed hotel assets in the market, perhaps due to the swift response by the government 
to contain COVID-19 and the sim stimulus package to help the hospitality industry. Sellers with holding power typically would also delay launches until perhaps the third quarter to see how things turn out. Investors are still on the lookout for hospitality opportunities, a bet most only interested in potential distress assets. Another sector that is worth looking out for is the industrial sector. We noticed that in Q1 2020, industrial investment actually held up quite well, actually grew by 8% year on year as compared to the overall investment market, which declined by about 32% year on year. Quality assets in the business park space and the logistics sector will continue to be of interest to many investors. However, at this juncture, pricing the assets is becoming a challenge given how quickly situations are evolving due to COVID-19. Still, we do expect a slowdown in the next quarter or two before things normalize and investors return to the market to hunt for quality assets. Thanks, and Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. I might keep going on that COVID-19 impact theme, um, which seems to be very popular today, and go um, around the region up to Tokyo and ask a question of you, Hideaki. Um, I think the Tokyo market, you know, held the crown in 2019 as the most popular Asia-Pacific inde investment destination overtaking Hong Kong. But thinking about COVID-19, what impact do you think that's going to have on transaction activities in the Tokyo market? And, you know, what's the response of the market been? You know, we've all seen on our TV screens that Japan had to make the difficult decision to postpone the Olympic Games. How has this been viewed by, by investors and, and what do you think the impact is on transaction activity? Sure, happy to do that. Thanks, Anna. So the current situation definitely slowing down that overall transaction in Japan. For example, public JVs, who is a major transaction driver, they are seeing a plunge in the stock price, which results in having higher hurdle rate for their acquisition. So they are moderating investment activities. And those who already invested in hotel and retail over time, they are also currently busy dealing with those assets, hygiene of their facility and rent negotiation for delay or reduced payments. In the national capital, who originally accounted for 15 to 20 percent of the overall transaction, not all of them, but many of them cannot do site, site inspection now. So the impact is likely to result in nearly 30 percent reduction in the overall transaction volume in 2020. At the same time, a number of value add and opportunistic players are seeing this time is the moment to buy quality assets. Uh, if you remember, the, since Abenomics started back to December 2012, the market has been enjoying great momentum. In fact, we've been having one of the longest economic expansion in history. At the same time, real estate has become very, very pricey, and the market has become more for core investors who can afford to pay higher price than value and opportunistic players. So those players have been waiting for any event to buy quality assets. And just to remind ourselves, this is a global pandemic but not a global financial crisis, right? So unlike GFC, financial system is still working really well in Japan. In other words, investors still have a really good access to a great amount of debt for any quality assets, the assets in the market. In terms of the postponement of the Olympic Games, that actually has been received as positive news among uh, market participants. Uh, if you remember, the benefits of Olympics are two things. One is the public spending for infrastructure improvement, and the second thing is inbound tourists, right? The first benefit is already taken, so the postponement is not going to bring us further infra projects, right? But the second benefit of inbound to tourists, that will help hotel and retail sectors to recover. So the, so the news has been received as positive news, Anna. Thanks, Hideaki. We look forward to seeing Tokyo in all its glory in 2021 with the Olympics. Can I just ask you a follow-up question? In your opinion, what sectors do you think hold the most appeal for investors at the moment in Japan? Yeah, sure. Actually, there are several angles to the questions. For example, for core investors, multifamily and logistic facilities still hold the most appeal because defensiveness of multifamily has been favored by core investors. House rent is non-discretionary expense for people, so people cannot leave or move out during the recession because they still need a house to live. And logistic facilities have a 
really good story with even more growing e-commerce sales under the current situation. So pricing for those sectors are likely to remain strong. However, hotel and retail assets are in trouble and the price decrease is almost inevitable. At the same time, these are the, actually the sector that value add and opportunistic players are keeping an eye. We know hospitality industry is gone for now, unfortunately, very sad, but we all also know that industry will come back. Especially in Japan, we are going to have an Olympics game in 2021 next year, which will help the industry to roll back, probably the much quicker than any other markets in Asia Pacific, which is very, very encouraging news for the investors. That of course, we do have to be selective on assets and markets. Otherwise, there is a risk of catching a falling knife. For example, some, some markets, we are originally anticipating rental drops, such as Osaka, Shinsaibashi area, Sendai area in Miyagi prefecture, or even Tokyo's Jiugaoka area. That is because fundamental demand was already, already shrinking on top of the consumption tax hike last year. So this is also the case for hotels. Yes, we had a really record high number of inbound tourists last year, but international visitors from Korea were already declining due to the Japan-Korea trade dispute. And this trade tension is likely to stay even after the outbreak. Some markets with high dependency on Korean tourists may not come back in short time. For those markets, we have to be very careful on the asset selection. And it is very, very important to assess, assess original trends before the outbreak. But again, um, hotel and retail sectors are one investors closely monitor, Anna. Thanks, Hideaki. You mentioned retail. We've just had a question come up about retail property investment. Um, so I might go to that. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about, you know, retail going um, through, I guess, fundamental restructuring as a sector and as an asset class. Yet some of the data that we were presented earlier um, shows that investment has remained fairly significant um, into the sector, despite, I guess, somewhat of a bleak outlook. Um, for retail as a segment and even further compounded by COVID-19 impact. I might ask you, Jamie, you know, what's your view on, on retail and, and funds flowing into that sector and why is the interest, I guess, continued to date? Uh, thanks, Anna, and thanks for the question. Um, so uh, no doubt COVID-19 has accelerated many trends uh, at the current time, um, and this has exacerbated the challenges in the traditional sort of bricks and mortar uh, retail sector. You know, um, there's many investors who have uh, strong asset management capabilities in the, the, the retail sector, and there's many that don't. And in, in some cases, we're seeing uh, properties not performing that, you know, with strong uh, hand at the helm can, can do a lot better. So there's still some great opportunities and the turmoil in the sector is actually creating opportunities for those players that have re real retail expertise. There's also a huge amount of repositioning of retail assets going on for a variety of different uses uh, and this is definitely creating um, some opportunity uh, for those investors who have the capability to reposition and come up with creative plans uh, online offline uh, retail activities we've also seen quite a bit of um, the online retailers going upstream moving upstream and actually using some of that capital that they have to acquire retail assets themselves Thanks, Jamie. Um, time has gone very quickly. We're nearly <laughs> at the end um, and I've got lots more questions, but what we will do is come back um, with responses on our website. I might just finish with one question um, for you, Dennis. There's been a question around Singaporean investors who have always been quite active in um, across the Asia Pacific region. You know, what are Singaporean investors looking at in terms of investment destinations and asset classes at the moment? Um, yeah, for preferred locations, I believe the next decade actually belongs to Asia, where the growth is, and Southeast Asia will be particularly interesting. We think that the industrial and logistic asset class will experience a sea of change, and big occupiers and investors alike will be looking for opportunities in this sub-region. Say, for example, Vietnam. You know, thanks to manufacturing companies transiting in its transition from China amidst the trade war and now COVID-19, the new free trade agreements, including the EU-Vietnam FTA, and the growing middle income in the country 
will continue to maintain industrial and logistic properties in relative high demand. If you're talking about more matured markets, Singapore, Australia, and even tier one cities in mainland China will continue to present very favorable long-term growth prospects. This is, I see, this is what I see you know, post COVID where the market will be going. Thanks, Dennis. I think, unfortunately, we are going to have to draw it to a conclusion there. Um, but before we go, I guess I just wanted to say that we have been inundated with questions and what we will do is get our panel of experts to answer those um, and send them out to everybody who's attended this webinar. Thank you very much for being part of our webinar on capital flows across Asia Pacific. Um, we've had a couple of hundred people um, dial in, so a great topic. I know that our capital markets experts are looking to put together future webinars um, around the region. And just to finish, here you can see contact details of the panelists um, and the speakers from the webinar. And I'd also just like to highlight um, our Greater China um, Capital Markets team led by Francis Lee, who's the chairman and the head of our Capital Markets Board in Asia Pacific. And along with Jason Zhang, who is the senior director and looks after outbound investment um, from Greater China. That team have done an amazing, um, or have an amazing track record of exporting capital out of China um, across all global markets. I think there's about $15 billion worth of capital exported over the, the past three years by this team. And you know some of their deals include the Walkie Talkie building in London, um, and you know, purchasing the um, logical um, European logistics platform from Blackstone for a record price as well. So they'd be more than happy to answer your questions. But as I said, we'll get back to you um, with those that we were unable to answer. We wanted to keep it short and sweet for the first time, but maybe we'll make it a little bit longer next time. So thank you everybody for participating. And most importantly, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much.